That brings us to our discussion items, which is item number 15, proposed revisions to board policy shown in Exhibit C. We'll start the discussion. Dr. Melton. Thank you, Chairman Dan. Board, if you'll join me with Exhibit C, page three. Um, this is in response to actually request on behalf of the board from back in the spring we were dealing with the student enrollment issue regarding a waiver. So we've convened a committee and the committee consisted of middle school representation, uh, a principal, an assistant principal for instruction, Ms. Garris, who is director of technology, and also a guidance counselor for one of our middle schools. The revisions that you see are primarily captured on page three, and this is relevant to our seventh and eighth grade. We feel like now with the changes of technology, the offerings that we could um, make available to our students, both online and virtually, that it's time for us to extend expand our offerings down into the middle level to make sure that we're staying competitive and making sure that we're keeping students in school district five. If you notice on page four, still with exhibit C, you see uh, the first bullet under the application for courses. We want to make sure that parents are involved with this and of course the principal or his or her designee are involved with this to make sure that we have some guidance to support the student and of course the parents' approval as well. And then you see beneath the last section, Virtual SC has changed its name as South Carolina Virtual School Program, so we wanted to make sure that we updated to capture Virtual SC instead of SC Virtual, just to make sure that we were clear with that recommendation, and of course capturing as well that last, um, the second sentences from the bottom, sec second section from the bottom, including the high school principal as well. Again, just making sure the communication and collaboration is in effect so that we're supporting students' requests, but making sure that the guidance that we're offering them is going to advance their academic efforts. So those are the re our recommendations regarding revisions to this policy in Exhibit C. Do you want to have any questions during this discussion? Please, uh, Ms. Hammond. I got one. Um, Dr. Melton, is, I want to be sure I understood this right. Um, and I think it's great. I agree with you taking it down to the middle school. I think that's so important. Um, because so, so much is formed right there before we get to high school. But I was, when, in reading this, the South Carolina Virtual School Program, that's different. That's where you can take the three, you take like three with the virtual school, South Carolina, and three in the, the home school of ours. Right? But this other part, is like they can take one course, but they, they're enrolled all day in our middle school. That's where I was a little bit confused. We would prefer, and I'm looking on page three, the second bullet, the middle school, we want to make sure that there are not conflicts with the schedule. And we want to make sure that our preferences, of course, that our students take courses with our teachers. But when there are unavoidable conflicts, we would use this as an option to back up that offering That's for the student. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We want to make sure, and if you notice the sentence beneath the bullets on page three, still in blue, the school must receive an official record of the final grade before awarding credit towards graduation. Of course, this is for students that are accelerated in seventh and eighth grade that are trying to get ahead with their academic program. So making sure that we've done all the right things that we're not haphazardly offering credits or courses where they think they're going to get credit, then they take the course and it doesn't qualify. What well, is the is the course, the actual course, let's say that kid fits one of the criteria and they're taking it in middle school age, is it Provided the teacher and all online is provided by the South Carolina State. Yes, ma'am, because they are approved. That's considered to be a partner of ours, the school district, of an all public education across South Carolina because they're accredited. I think it's good. Did a good job. I commend the committee. You have a question on this particular policy? Well, we go, we'll go to item number 16, which is the social studies education policy, is shown in Exhibit B. Yes, sir, and Chairman Gann, if I may explain to the board, um, number 16, 17, and 18, as you preview the materials for this evening, you probably thought, we just saw these back in the spring, and we just approved these in March and April, and indeed you did. When we sent policies in, um, Ms. Stowers, of course, is our connection when she sends them in to school boards for formatting. We received some feedback from the School Boards Association that some of these model policies that we had used as our platform changed sometime during the academic year last year. So when I called the School Board Association, I asked the assistant that was assisting me, how has this been communicated to school districts? And the response was, 
That's a great question. So after that call, then an email went out to all the superintendents to make sure everyone's brought up to speed. So these changes that you're going to be seeing in Exhibit D, E, and F, 16, 17, and 18 on your discussion agenda for this evening, are things that I'm bringing back to you that have been changed slightly. So in Exhibit, uh, exhibit D, if you'll join me, uh, number three with blue, let's start with social studies first. You will see under the section of Veterans Day, we have made a deletion there on that first line. Really, the, the context here is captured in blue for you. In the previous policy that you approved for us back in April, we were trying to use the school day that was closest to Veterans Day. So let's imagine Veterans Day occurs on a Saturday or a Sunday or a school day that we are not in school, a day of the week that we're not in school. So we were trying to make sure that we had an assembly, some sort of celebration as close as possible to the actual event. But the school board had changed because of legislation. But what you see in blue is actually expectation on the school day immediately preceding November the 11th if schools are closed on Veterans Day. So if it happens to be a weekend, if it happens to be a day that we're not in school, this is now the regulation across the state that we're making sure that we're in compliance with. So you're going to see a deletion of that paragraph and then a revision. So those are the recommendations that we're having for Exhibit D for you this evening regarding social studies education. Shall I continue or pause for prayer? Okay. Yes, I just... Can you can you explain to us why they're deleting the phrase to honor veterans? Uh, no, ma'am. I, I did not get the context of that, but obviously we had it in the April policy, and the recommendation is not to include that. Would you like for us to try again? Well, I, I can't imagine why you, we would delete that. I mean, I, I, perhaps there's a reason, but I don't see it. It's not obvious to me. When we get the model policies, um, we were giving the context and writing and they were allowed to make some personalization. And I'll use, for example, with primary report cards. You're given what's required, but then you can personalize it. This is one of those places where we're um, asked to be standardized with that. But we can certainly leave it in to see if it's allowed to pass through. Well, I mean, this is the school district's policy. The board votes on that, so I would think that we have the right to keep that in. I mean, that would be that would be my suggestion. I, I just think to remove it is disrespectful. So you restore the phrase to honor veterans and, and that's the first line, the beginning of the second line under the heading of Veterans Day. Right, right. That that would be my recommendation. Of course, the whole board will have to um, discuss it at, at the first reading, decide if they want to do that. But that would be my recommendation. Did you say a minute ago, just for clarification, that the blue area was the state law change? Yes, sir. The line through is the suggested model policy for the school association? The line where the things have been lined through, that was what we passed in April. So our recommendation then, and what was passed by the board, was that we would find a school day that was closest to November the 11th. But now the regulation is to define the school day immediately preceding November the 11th. Should it crawl on a, week, a weekend or a day that we're out of school? Go back to where Ms. Hudson is. Who struck the two honor veterans? Is that come school board association? Yes, sir. Not state law. I wouldn't think. Not that I'm aware of, no, sir. I, I would agree. We can. We have our uh, reading votes. I would agree with trying to have the language. We, we will, we'll act on the policy of the school district finals. Did you have something else, Ms. Hudson? No, no, no. That's good. good. Thanks. Was the because I don't have the, you know, the policy that we uh, adopted comparing to, the, I guess, the old, old policy. Right. <laughs> was, was the, to study the United States Constitution and Declaration, was that added? Is that why they took the veterans out? Because they added, I was just trying to figure out the rationale for that. Mr. Case, I'm afraid if I were to answer you, I would give you misinformation. Okay. So. That's fine. I can call school boards. I certainly, no, I certainly agree that we should keep the phrase as it was, not as it's indicated. Ms. Hammond. I think I have some answers okay. that could, could relate to this. Um, I agree with Ms. Hutchinson. Like there's no reason to take that out. But I can tell you that we, uh, as an eighth grade teacher, we, uh, we have to have Veterans Day. And the whole purpose by every teacher 
lets every student know it is to honor veterans. So I, I get, I mean, I'm with you that why I take it out, but I would just let you know the reasoning of the school board association could be if you are having a whole day called Veterans Day, and I mean, we do the whole thing, and I know a lot of y'all have been invited to things, but it, it, there's no way you wouldn't know it's honoring veterans. Uh, as far as, you know, you, know, you might not re ever read our policy that doesn't say it, but that's what it's for. Then the Constitution, and, and, and that's a federal law, so, you know, you have to have Constitution Day, and you have to teach um, the Declaration of Independence and Constitution. So, I, I'm, I'm speaking like from a teacher, where we're looking at it as a board. So, I agree with Ms. Hutchinson. If, if I were a board member reading that, or even somebody that wants to sit down and read our policy, which I don't think is very fun reading, and a lot of people don't read the policy until it's like something they're trying to find. But I think it's great to put it back in there. But I did just want to tell you, in, the, in, the, in, in implementation is what I want to say. It is, you know that it's to honor better. That's all you talk about all day, so, which is wonderful. You invite them there, we write them, we, I mean, every school does something different, I assume. You just, and, and we have to let our principal know what you're doing and, 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 and be sure, and they know you have honored veterans that day. So I think it gets done, and that might be why school board association was just looking at it like they didn't need that verbiage. Because it was self like if you have veterans day, that's what it's for. Mr. White. It, is it not possible just to call the school board association? Yes, sir, I made that note, and I'll just call it to And then, if it's not a law, it's not a legal implication, then put it back in. I, I'd, I'd be curious why they struck it, rather than us debate it. Uh, but, uh, Comments, questions? Good point, Ms. Hutchinson. Thank you. We're giving our patriotic feathers up. Aren't we? Well, I know we have several veterans sitting at this table. That's right. So uh, we have to honor those in attendance, but all those others. There you go. Shall we move now to the yes, let's go to and this seven. is um, another policy that we passed actually in May regarding promotion and retention of students. Uh, the first change we have is in number six in blue for page number that's noted for you. And you're going to see just a, a change of the verbiage here. We had previously with limited English proficiency and notice in blue who were classified as English language learners. So the two years will still be in effect of instruction in the English program. It's just a simple phrasing of how information is expected based upon the school board model policy. And then if you'll join me back on page eight. Dr. Mountain, should that say English language? Well, you, you said English language learners, but it's no, just English learners. Language is changing. We were at English limited proficiency. Yeah, we were cool. ELP, we were EPP, we were ELL. Now it looks like we're moving towards English learners. Okay. So that's just a trend of how we change verbiage and, and the jargon of education. So page eight in blue, if you'll notice at the top, there has been an addition where a unit can be earned for either foreign language or career and technology education. So we're broadening the options there for earning credits. That's at the top of the page, second line. And then notice a retention paragraph. Um, if you'll recall, this board passed a retention policy, but based on the model policy, there's an insertion with this policy specifically about retention. So this is a brief paragraph. We did make sure that our principals who were involved with the previous committee had a chance to review this, and there was comfort with allowing this language to go per the recommendation of the School Board's Association. So those are the recommendations for revisions from the policy just passed in May. Okay, Ms. Hutchinson. I'd like to suggest that we, I'm not quite sure if we want to add it to the policy, but I know that the school district does a great job in data collection. Um, but what I'd like to see is that the school board receives, you know, maybe a written report about the number of students per grade, per school, who, who are retained at the end of the academic year. I, I have no idea, I have no concept. Um, and then I think it would be helpful for the board to be provided a three-year comparison, or whatever's appropriate, um, several years comparison. And I think the 
report should also provide the percentage of economically disadvantaged students in the analysis. I think we do this regularly, but I think it's important for us to pay particular attention to those um, students um, who fall in that category to see, you know, what is it? What is the? What are the problems? Is there anything that that we can help with? I know you do that all the time, so I'm not necessarily adding anything new, but I just want to make sure that the board um, receives that information because I think it's really important to to one of the missions, many missions that we have for the school district is to to make sure our students graduate from high school. Kate. The uh, retention policy on page eight is basically says the decision will be made by the principal. Is there an appeal to that? And if so, should that be uh, included here or at least referenced here? We can certainly add that. Within the retention policy, there um, can be a child study team that be inclusive of a variety of personnel at the school to do an analysis. Of course, it always is inclusive of the parent. Um, currently in School District 5, when there is an appeal, Typically, it's for retention where parents are requesting a retention, whereas the school may be suggesting the child be promoted. Um, we always do a child review study, make sure the parent is at the table. That's part of our practices that we do, but we can certainly include any language that the board may wish. And I saw that previously in the policy, and it comes to mind just from personal experience is that late birthday where they wanted to delay, sorry. Um, but, but I just didn't know if we needed to clarify that there was an appeal process uh, to that uh, retention paragraph. Okay, we can certainly add that. Any other questions? Let's go to number 18, which is our summer school exhibit F. And this policy as well was passed in May of 2017. There are um, several changes, and this is on page three in blue. It's all captured on this one page. The first paragraph, if you notice, ends with uh, an additional sentence, and it basically just captures that summer schools should have the same rigor, um, which means, of course, it shouldn't just be you attend and you pass. There should be a rigorous curriculum in place. The second paragraph defines how many hours a student should be in court, scheduled in coursework, and making sure that the credits that are earned have prior approval by the building level principal. We never want a student to enter into summer school thinking that it's going to help them capture credit to recover and then find out after the work has been done that it was not a course that had been approved so the child may have wasted their time if they chose to go outside of school district five. Of course, the courses that we offer during the summer in school district five, you can certainly make sure this is clear, but there is a pre-approval process just for the assurance of that student to know that they're not wasting their time or their family's resources. The third paragraph, you'll notice an insertion there per the model policy. Uh, the inclusion of textbooks we previously had providing instructional materials the model policy said and textbooks to make sure the textbooks were not someplace in a closet or cabinet that they were actually viable and active with the summer school instruction you notice a simple revision from program to aspect of the summer school program so just those uh, additional words there to bring any clarity that a parent may need and then the last paragraph on page three, you'll notice where this, of course, is about the Read to Succeed legislation, which is in effect this year. Our current third graders will be the first cohort of students that may be affected by required retention should they not show that they're proficient as a third grade reader by the end of the school year. So you see a couple of changes there from, instead of completing summer school, participating in summer school, in a summer reading program or a camp, Instead of evidence by at the conclusion of the third grade year and demonstrate through either reading portfolio. So just a little more flexibility there because the State Department is still trying to define what that process may look like. Of course, not all student can students can necessarily attend during the summer, depending on child care, depending on family circumstances. So there will be a portfolio that we can offer as one of the options to review a child's complete academic record as opposed to just one simple assessment that may be a determining factor that may not be the right decision for that particular student. So those are the recommendations for the revision of the summer school policy. Ms. Hutchison. Once again, this is about um, data collection, which our school district does wonderfully, but also reporting to the board. 
And I think that because we have this new state law um, for reading proficiency um, by the third grade, that I think it's even more important for the school board to, um, to be on top of, of what's going on. And I'll give you a copy of this, but um, basically I you know, would like to measure the outcomes of summer camp, uh, provide to the board the number of students per school who attended summer school, <coughs> Um, due to the retention policy and those who were retained but did not attend the summer camp. Once again, that's looking at was there something that we don't know about by those students who aren't attending, like you, you mentioned just a few minutes ago, um, in an effort to save every student. And um, for the cohort of retained third graders who did attend, then I'd like to see a breakdown by school of the number of students who move to the next grade and those who are retained in the third grade. So this is once again the success rate. Um, and these reports should also provide the percentage of economically disadvantaged students in the analysis. And as the years go by, uh, provide comparisons. Of course, the first year I it might be difficult. Um, well, you couldn't do that. So um, let's see. I think that's I think that's it, and and I know you do a lot, great job of collecting data, but you know when you win the lottery or <laughs> the other people and and move on, I do want to make sure that future um, administrations realize the importance of collecting data and making sure that the school the school board knows about it. So I'll share this with you. Ms. Hutchinson, I can actually say we have that data available already because we do a report at the end of each summer school before we to succeed. So oh. if the board wishes to have that report, we could offer it whenever you all would like to see it. Um, for example, I can say to you that we had 35 families decline our We to Succeed camp this summer of 17. So we were able to reach down and capture some rising third graders that were currently finished in second grade that we had concerns about because we didn't fill the summer reading camp for We to Succeed with the current third grade cohort looking to be promoted to fourth grade. Um, so we can share it whenever you're ready for that between Dr. Harris's department and mine. We can certainly create a report to bring before the board. I'll leave that up to the board officers to determine a, a good time for the for this information to be presented to the board. Okay. Ms. Hammond, then we'll come back to Mr. Cates. Um, I, I am so excited about this program. I, I really do think that it's gonna, it, it's gonna take a few years, but I'm anxious to see by the time if we catch them early that we're not going to have the dropout rate and we're going to not have them make it to middle school and can't read. But what I, I am interested in and seeing if it's left to the individual districts or whether my experiment through the state has a, a portfolio um, template, for lack of a better word. But I was interested to see because I do realize every child might be a, a different circumstance, but there should be I guess, even though that's really young, there's a third grade level of words they should know. And I was just curious to see how that reading portfolio, or uh, what did they put, or a uh, norm reference alternative assessment that their mastery of the state standards in reading is equal to at least a level above the lowest level on the state reading assessment. That was a little um, confusing to me to really, especially as a teacher, what is it they expect? our child to be able to do, our student. And so I would just say, you know, you may not have that answer yet, but if you if you do, I would be very interested to see how uh, that portfolio set, yeah, and, and my biggest interest is in this third grade, is this, the new, this initiative is really, in, uh, many teachers believe that, that literacy is the key. And, and we get them early enough, this is gonna be the answer. So I'd really like to know how we're gonna Mr. Cates. First, let me just say thank you. I, I really have thought all along that if the state wanted a great model for literacy, they could have looked for what uh, you and your staff have so done so well over the years. And, uh, having uh, uh, children of my own involved in those programs, I, I appreciate the commitment that the district has shown and the trust um, where we're headed uh, with the leadership that we have. Just wanted to clarify something you said about 35 families that declined. Clarify that for me. So are those 35 
uh, students that would not have, that would have been retained because they failed to participate in a summer program that could have been retained um, this past 16 17 academic year we did not retain based on reading level um, unless there was a just cause in school district 5 historically we have a very low retention rate now the middle level and the high school level we can take that we do have students that attend summer school for credit recovery but at the elementary level we make sure that we're intervening as quickly and as effectively as we possibly can to make sure the students don't need that but if i look over we've actually had uh, four summers now ready to succeed with three of those years being for the summer reading camp uh, 2015 we had 16 families that declined the opportunity 2016 we had eight families that declined the opportunity in 2017 we had 30 families 35 families declined the opportunity so there are varying um, reasons for that sometimes children are signed up for camps sometimes they go and stay with relatives sometimes there are conflicts with what the family would prefer doing sometimes the families don't feel like there is a need that they would prefer working on things at home as opposed to committing a full uh, or not a full day but the full six weeks of the coursework that they need to complete so there's all kinds of reasons, but whenever we don't fill seats, we make sure that we find a way to fill. So this year, as I explained earlier, we looked at rising third graders, those that just finished second grade, that we were concerned about, we wanted to strengthen some. We certainly can't require families to participate, but it is one opportunity. And um, as far as the portfolios that Ms. Hammond requested earlier, there's a um, good cause exemption that is still being defined for us. The portfolios are still being defined for us. So as that information is sent to us from the State Department last Thursday and Friday, we were in meetings about just that. So um, we're still on the learning curve of how we're going to do this, and you can anticipate the first year won't be perfect. But Ms. Goggins and her staff have worked with our elementary principals to make sure the communications that we have in place, we are going to alert families around the winter break so that there aren't surprises in the spring that children are not performing where they should be performing. So we've got flyers, we've got parent-friendly letters, we've got things on the website, and we're trying to make sure that we're reaching out in as many ways as we can to communicate this to make sure families are aware of this. So, just so I understand, now my, typically my go-to answer when I'm asked about this is to email Dr. Melton, but the summer camp is really a key component to be able to, to be uh, promoted to if, if they are behind in that third grade level, that summer camp is a key component to them being able to be promoted to the fourth, fourth grade. And declining that summer camp could have pretty significant impact on the things you're able to do to help promote that student. I'm always going to argue that it's the most viable option because we recruit the most viable teachers for this camp. We are highly competitive. This goes out to an application process led by Dr. Jakes and her department, and then the, inter the interviews occur through the instructional department. So we are very intentional to choose what I'll call top gun teachers, the best of the best. They're the ones that are teaching these students that need that intervention and that support throughout the summer. A family can always say, we're going to work on this summer, I'm going to hire a tutor, we're going to go to this vendor, then we can reassess when the student returns after the summer has concluded and make the decision at that point. But we want to make the best opportunity for our students for transitional purposes and not put decisions off until August and later. Um, we could talk about summer slide, which of course research shows that if students are not reading throughout the summer, they are likely to slide backwards and regress with their reading performance. But I feel like we can stand behind our program. Dr. Hefner received a report from the State Department. They send someone out to do an unannounced visit. And every year that we've had an on-site visit for three years, we've gotten glowing remarks and wanting to send people into our summer per into our summer camp to see what we're doing because of the caliber of what we do. And I'll also add to that, uh, shout out to United Way of the Midlands. They have given us grants that we have sought ranging from $6,600 to $10,000 for the three years that we've done this. So we found a partner with United Way, and it's, it's like the Oprah um, event where you get all kinds of gifts and prizes at the end. You get an LLB book bag. You get 20 texts that you've selected from a book fair at your reading level. Um, the LLB book bag is a lifetime warranty. You get a Ranger Rick for a year being sent to your home. You get field learning experiences. You get a t-shirt that when you go on the field learning experiences, the teachers can see our group together and they have a point of pride that they are in the summer reading camp of School District 5. So it is truly a day of, 
a celebration and families are in attendance and it's always exciting to see the children get so dressed up because they see it as a rite of passage in a sense, but they also see it as a huge celebration. I have a chance to intermingle with families who say how their reading attitudes have changed and what it means for their family that their child had that opportunity. And then we also include just storage bins to make sure that these books that the students have chosen can be stored someplace in their home or in their car so they can be protected and read um, however long they can keep up with them. So Mr. Cates, I'm always going to say School District 5 has the best five uh, options. So yes, sir, to answer your yeah. question in a non-political way, I knew we're that. the best. I knew <laughs> that. And I, and I guess we're looking at times of day and locations. I just concern when I see a little bit of a spike sure. in the, the number of families that decline and maybe it's, you know, we may have to be uh, even more creative and when and where we offer those. Well, please uh, know, it isn't just a simple send check yes or no, letter oh, return right. it. There are parent conferences, there are phone outreaches, there are conversations uniquely and personally with each family involved with this opportunity. Ms. Hammond. That, this goes along with that. Does each, or depending on the number, which elementary schools do you put, use as the location? We transport, thanks to Dave Wiseman, Ms. Richardson, um, everyone is transported into one centralized location of Harbison West. So we transport students in from all over the district that choose to participate. So they have, they have um, the transportation, the transportation is, is provided, just, yes ma'am. That's awesome. This is one question about, the, do we have the grad point for all the students that they say if they miss so many days it would stop them from getting credit, that, and, but they don't need summer school and they can, sometimes you call it seed time, do we have that to offer the kids that, so that they don't have summer school? The new accountability model is going to be, um, Dr. Harrison, I would probably say transformational. So <laughs>